All right, let's get started now. All right, welcome everyone. So this will be EECS 2030 section F. Just make sure you're in the right section. So there are five sections for this course. I think uh, section A, C, and E probably. So three sections somehow run similar grading scheme, but I'm running my own scheme. So just make sure you're not running to the wrong section, okay? Right, so today uh, I want to spend a good amount of time to really walk you through about how the course is going to be run. It's going to be completely in-person delivery, but uh, I'll talk about mass policy. I think uh, what you guys are doing now is definitely fine, but let's uh, have some protocol just uh, for us to follow. Anytime during the lecture, just like pre uh, before the pandemic, anything you want to clarify, raise your hand or just interrupt me. I don't mind at all. I don't mind interruption. All right, let's not go over. I want to spend the first part going over the syllabus. And then if we got any time remaining, I would like to start with the lecture contents, which will be to review OOP, foundational for this course. All right, what about me? I don't think any one of you would have taken a course with me. I've been here for about five years, but since you guys just from first year, I didn't teach first year last year, so uh, I don't think, but anyway, feel free to call me Jackie. That's the name I really prefer. But if you want to, you want to call me Professor Jackie, Professor whatever, that's okay. No, I'm quite an informal person. And any time during the course, if you need any advice, maybe the way I teach wouldn't suit you very well, or if you think there's anything else I can do, or any, any complaint, any comments, let me know. Okay, I definitely need your feedback. And, yeah, that's basically what I said, okay? And if you haven't enrolled in the course just yet, maybe you're on, on the wait list, please make sure email me right away after the class. Uh, you can find my contact information on my website. And I do apologize, somehow my credential for A your plus wouldn't allow me to log in just for today. I will sort it out with the IT people today. So next time will be fine. But I'm gonna refer you to all the website. They're already up in the, uh, it's very easy to find. Okay, send me your name, student number, passport, your ID, so I can add you to the E-class site. Later on, when we release the labs, you will be able to get instructions. Okay. And you want to keep up with the lectures and study items, uh, which I'll walk you through when I go over the syllabus. You want to make sure there's no delay and no extension. All right. Okay, mass policy. At, at the moment, university does not require, so if you choose not to wear, that's absolutely fine. However, we can only recommend and encourage you, at least, if you want to wear a mask, please, like me, feel free. If you decide not to, please try to minimize talking, uh, since we, we want to, you know, for the obvious reason. And if you really want to uh, consume your breakfast or drink, I know it's a very early class. It's tough for everybody, including myself. I try my best. So try to minimize that. Okay, I'll really uh, be grateful. But I think uh, minimize talking will definitely uh, uh, help a lot. But if you want to ask me a question, of course, you got to talk. Just uh, shout out. Right, so I think, uh, uh, I think that's kind of uh, the uh, protocol I would really appreciate if you can try as much as possible talking or using a mobile phone for anything that's not relevant to the course will be distracting mainly to me since I try to maintain eye contact to everybody. So it could be a little bit distracting. And so try to minimize. If I really find it very distracting, I'll let you know in a polite way. Okay, if you, uh, okay, uh, okay so this is really important. Normally, I do two things in the lecture. I got slides, and also you will see that my teaching style, I use a lot of my iPad to really walk you through examples in depth, hopefully as much detail as possible. So for the slides, they're very self-contained. So I wouldn't read off the slides. That's a waste of your time. What I would do instead, Sometimes I might just tell you, okay, study from this range of slides, and then let's now go over some example on the iPad to give you uh, some, in, uh, some insights. I think that might be the best way to help you learn. So I really encourage you to come to the class. That's really worth your time, at least if I'm your instructor. Okay, I'll focus more on the core concept, example, and of course answer your questions. That your engagement is really important. Ask me questions. Okay, writing email, this one I wouldn't waste too much of time, so I think a formality is not really necessary, but at least maybe some courtesy will be very appreciated. You can look at some example, and then just call me Jackie in the email. That's absolutely no problem, okay? Just try not to be too rude in the email. All right, course information. Uh, there will be two sites you really have to check regularly. One will be the e-class for the obvious reason, a uh, very quick recap. For E-class, I'm going to post mainly the uh, lab instructions over there. And during some of your scheduled lab sessions, I will also have some online 
uh, quizzes or tests. It's going to be invigilated, so you have to physically go to the Williams Small Center, your schedule, uh, where your uh, schedule lab takes place, and then you're going to take the quizzes over there using eClass. That's something I'll give you more explicit instruction later. But for now, just remember, you have to go to somewhere on the campus, the schedule lab place, to take the test. So eClass site, uh, again, I don't have internet access today, so you can just click on the link and then check it. Okay. So I'm gonna, uh, you will receive an announcement from me very regularly. Every time there's any updates, I'll let you know. I'll try to keep you informed. Lab exercises, and uh, also written test. So here, the reason I said lab one is because uh, I will show you the second site, which is public domain. You don't need any enrollment for that. For your lab zero part one and part two, which is going to take place in the coming two weeks, I only put that on my uh, departmental site, which is public domain. So you can just go with it right away. Then check your emails regularly, please. If you haven't heard back from me, let's say for one or two days, it should not be normal. Just get in touch with me. Oh, did I miss anything on the course? Yeah, this will be the second site in addition to the e-class. So uh, it's very easy to Google me. Just Google Jackie Wang, W-A-N-G, my last name, and York University. You can easily find my home website and then go under lectures. You will see EECS 2030 for this term. Just go there, and then next time, once I fix the Wi-Fi issue next Monday, I'll walk you through a little bit on the website, but you can just go there. And the course syllabus is posted on that site, but I'm going to go over that with you point by point. Okay. And before I start going over the course syllabus with you, is there any question? Please feel free. Anyone? Okay. Let's now talk about the syllabus. And to really find the syllabus, you can easily just go to, I can leave you, uh, for those of you who want to go there together with me, you can just go to this site, ecs.yoku.ca, tell.jackie, slash teaching, slash lectures, and then once you go there, you can find 2030.422 on the top. And there's a link for the syllabus PDF. Okay, let's now go over that. Okay. Let me just make sure. Okay. Syllabus should be over here. All right, that's a PDF. Uh, the last, this was last updated just today, earlier this morning, but according to the university policy, I might still change a bit the grading policy until September 20th. I don't think it's very likely, but if I ever make any changes to what I say today, I will let you know explicitly, right? It's a fair game, all right. Okay, course policy. Number one, okay, that's something I'm experimenting this, uh, this year, maybe to your advantage. You might be wondering, what about labs? There will be a scheduled lab every week. You will get lab zero, part one, part two, and lab one up to lab five. You got seven, uh, sorry, lab one to lab four. You got six labs in total, okay? They account for 12% of your course grade. However, I try to make the grading part very straightforward for you. As long as you submit something by the deadline of the lab, you get a 12% automatically. Which means if you really decide to simply submit the starter code I gave to you, you simply uh, decided to submit an empty folder, you still get a 12%. Okay, why? Let me go over it with you. Okay, so let's talk about it. So the teamwork, you can feel free to work on the labs with your classmate together. There will be no risk of violating academic policy. You can approach the TA even asking hints on the solution. You can approach me even asking me for uh, maybe hints on the solution. We'll be more than happy to maybe give you some hints to lead you to the solution. Okay? You can easily get a 12%. That's not an issue. Okay, okay yours, uh, let me see this. Okay, let me go over sentence by sentence. You will be able to gain the full marks for all the labs as long as you, submit, uh, you, you complete your submission in time. But if you miss the deadline, too bad. It's, uh, you cannot get a percentage, right? Just that's a minimum I require because we still want to get your best attempts for the submission and we want to grade you properly. So let's say, let's say for example, let's say for lab number one, if you receive the feedback saying that you got 70% for the lab, what does that mean? That means you still get a 2% for the lab itself. On the other hand, if the lab were to be treated as a programming test, you would have gotten 70%. So that's really like a 
rehearsal, like an exercise for you to know how well you would do on the programming test. So only for feedback purpose. But as long as you submit something, you always get full marks. Okay? That's something I'll keep emphasizing. I know it might sound a little bit confusing at the, in the beginning, but it will be clear after the first few weeks. You get full marks automatically, and it will still be graded and given detailed feedback. And for this course, we're going to use Eclipse and JUnit test cases a lot. For those of you who may not have seen that in your first year, no problem. The first two weeks will be your window of, of uh, opportunity to really learn that properly. I got tutorial videos recorded by myself. I got some lecture hours dedicated to reviewing the core concept, so you should be okay after the first two weeks. Just make sure you put in the time. Okay, let's see this. Uh, okay, it will, it's going to exemplify how the actual programming test will be graded. And I'll talk about programming tests a little bit, long, uh, a little bit later. And it would be your best interest in submitting work representing your true and best attempt. It is okay to submit something that you really cannot really make it. Just still submit it. At least you push yourself to work before the deadline. But I would say try to be honest, not to me, to yourself. If you simply just want to, let's say, copy your friend's work and submit in the last minute just to get a 2%, you still get it. But you're going to risk yourself have, uh, having some very poor performance in the programming test. Right? You can see the consequence of that. Right? I'll keep you know, motivating you guys to really uh, focus on the learning. Okay, rationale very quickly. You can rest assured you will not lose any marks from the labs, which my students in the past, they really kind of panic when they actually lose uh, maybe too many marks from the lab. I don't want you to re really worry too much. Labs are really designed for you to learn. And to really assess your ability to program, it will be the scheduled tests in the Williams Small Center. Okay, and then you can just focus on learning by seeking help from colleagues, TA, myself, without worrying about violating the policy. Okay, finally. So try not to abuse the policy. Of course, you, you are still 100% responsible for learning the, uh, you know, the materials. And except uh, for lab zero part one and part two, you got one week each. You don't have much to do. Basically, just follow through the tutorial video. Make sure you can actually type out the code and reproduce everything. Starting from lab number one, you get at least two weeks for each lab. So you definitely got sufficient time to really uh, go around asking for help myself PA, your classmate, and then just make sure you still complete the lab in time, okay? And get it 2%. All right, so plagiarism will only be applicable to the scheduled test, either written test on the E-class or the programming test, which I'll give you maybe some makeup, uh, like, sorry, not makeup, some uh, mock-up test, like a rehearsal test, maybe later. So you definitely get comfortable with it, okay? And, okay, so, even though you will get automatic marks for labs, but you still have to respect fully the deadline. For example, if, the, if you miss the deadline, even though you might say, oh, you know what, I tried to maybe work on that a little bit more to be perfect. No, you have to submit before the deadline. Otherwise, we cannot really uh, give it to the TA in time for grading. And again, for late enrollment, make sure you send me the email so I enroll you in the uh, uh, E-class. Any questions so far? So these are the most important course policies. Yes. You mean the test? Sure. The question was, can I explain more about the format for the written test and programming test? Yes. Very briefly, but you can, uh, you can be, uh, you can be in short, uh, about at least one week before the actual test, I'll always give you some study guide. Okay? But for written tests, it's going to be multiple choice based on E+. -class. You have to physically go to the Williams Small Center, find some workstation, me and, my, uh, me and the TA will be there to reach, invigilate, you just log into E+, -class and then take the test. Number one, okay, that's for written test. For programming test, it's going to be based on, you will be given, I'll also show you the requirement document you should really study in the first two weeks as well. You will be given some API somehow, like, a, uh, like an interface to program against, and then you gotta submit maybe one or multiple classes in Java for grading. And the way we do grading is by using JUnit test cases, automatic grading. So for example, if we run 10 test cases on your submission, you pass six, you get 60% for the, for the test. And it's a very common grading criterion, even in the industry, because if you really want to know how well you have developed the software, you have to know how well you can pass all the test cases. For example, if you want to lead code, usually when they actually ask you to submit your solution for some data structure, they kind of run the test cases to show you how well your solution is. But in this course, 
we don't really grade you manually uh, in the sense that we don't really look into your code structure, even though you thought your code actually looks perfect, but it doesn't really work in terms of passing test cases. I'm sorry, that's not the way we grade. But maybe later in the third year, in 3311, in the software design course, for example, people might pay more attention to the structure of your code. But in this course, we're only going to grade you by test cases. But to really get a perfect idea about what JUnit test cases are, you will do lab zero part one and part two. That will prepare you well for that. Of course, if you got any further clarification about the JUnit test cases, we'll talk about it throughout the semester. It's a very important practice I, I would like you to adopt early. Okay. Can, can I answer your question, maybe? We'll, we'll go over that. The question was, how much would the uh, test uh, weight? Well, I'll talk about it. Yes. You have to come physically, I'm afraid. Yeah. So the question was, can you actually write a programming test or the written test uh, virtually? Uh, no, you have to come. If you really, for example, of course, if you really feel unwell, you feel uh, you got some very uh, emergent situation that can be documented, we will still do what we used to do before the pandemic. Just send me the documents and then we'll, we'll talk about accommodation. Yeah, for sure. But try to minimize that. Okay. One thing I want to tell you as well, uh, which I might just go over a little, a little bit later. What I typically do, let's say if you miss a written test or if you uh, miss a programming test, we don't normally do like a makeup test because the test questions have been already released to your classmate who took the test in time. So it may not be so fair to let you take the same test again. What I typically do is, is to shift the weights of the test into the exam. But I would suggest personally not to do it because exam is going to be a challenging one. It's going to put everything together. It's going to be in person. There will be multiple choice. There will be written question in the exam. You may not want to shift the uh, weights to the exam. That's my personal advice, okay? Alrighty. That's about the course policy, okay? And then, yeah, oh, very important for you to know, okay, you already know who I am, Jackie, and then if you ever want to send me an email, jackie at eecs.yoku.ca, if I'm very accessible to my computer, I'll reply to you as soon as I can. Normally, I try to do that. And you can always find uh, some information about the lecture just from my home webpage. Just go to the lectures tab on the left. You can always find it quite easily. Okay, for office hour, well, I would say somehow I kind of uh, more ad adapted to the idea of a, of a virtual office hour, but I think the hybrid might be the best for you guys. So I'll, I'll try this. Let's try the following. Uh, if you want to see me in person, if you prefer, see me on Tuesday, Thursday from 12.30 to 1.30. Okay, like today, I'll, my office hours start today. If you want to see me virtually, you can see me between 4 p.m. Uh, and also 5 p.m., Monday and Wednesday. So if you want to speak to me already this afternoon, 4, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., click on the Zoom link over here, and then you can speak to me over the Zoom. Sometimes I might be uh, connecting to Zoom from my office, maybe from my home or elsewhere, but at least you can always find me over here. But if none of the hours work for you, no problem. Send me an email and we'll make, we'll make appointment. Okay, that's always possible. Okay, so just about the venues for where you should go, just notice that for some very funny reason, we need to meet in different places on Monday and Wednesday. Okay, just remember next Monday, we're gonna, we're gonna see you life science building, right? Of course, sometimes if you don't see me showing up in time, it could be that I went to the wrong classroom, but bear with me, I'll be back, just in case. Right, for the cl uh, e-class site, I'm pretty sure most of you, if you're enrolled, you already received some announcement from me yesterday, right? So, so that means you're already enrolled. So just go there. Uh, I think currently there, there's not much uh, in the e-class site just yet. What you need to go would be, I'll make it larger. This will be the link which I gave to you also yesterday. So go to ECS 2030 422, right? Any slides, notes, uh, links to the tutorial, uh, syllabus, uh, lab zero instruction, they are there. Okay. And for those of you who may not feel so confident about Java, maybe you think that maybe you should have spent maybe uh, more time in the first year, you can definitely pick up. I think now is the time. Don't really procrastinate until maybe 2011 or maybe later. Now is the time, okay? That's why usually uh, my student told me that it's such a big conceptual jump to go from first year into 2030. I agree, it would definitely cover some more advanced stuff. At the same time, 
your foundation from the first year is so important. You don't want to really let it go, right? If you want to have more practice, you can definitely go to this particular link for the tutorial. That's what I created for uh, your colleagues back in Winter 21. It's a uh, pre-recorded uh, tutorials. Uh, I think they're rather clear. But if you want to, uh, let's say, pick up any basic concept, you can go there. Okay. And for those of you who really love reading, in that case, you can definitely consider this textbook if you want to. But in this course, the only required materials to study will be my slides and my lecture materials. Okay? But if you read some textbook, you run into some difficulty, let me know. I'll be more than happy to get involved. Okay. And overall, you can definitely get help beyond the lecture either through my in-person or virtual office hour where you can just come to the scheduled lab session. Okay, scheduled lab session. We do not take any attendance for the scheduled lab in the Williams Mall Center. You just make sure you show up when there is a scheduled test, which I'll show to you when they are. It's already a fixed date. When there are no scheduled tests in the Williams Mall Center, you can feel free to come by. Normally, I try to be there, and the TA will be there. We can speak to you about any concerns or any clarification, not just about the lab exercises. Maybe you got some confusion from the lecture. You got some confusion about certain concept. It's also a good way to catch me. Right? What about in-class lecture? Do I take attendance? Yes and no. Yes, I take it. No, you wouldn't get penalized for the percentage, but you would get bonus for attending lecture. I'll explain that in just a moment. Okay? Bear with me. Okay, prerequisite course description and also course learning outcome. Let me, let me talk a little bit about course learning outcome so you can have some uh, idea. My plan is for now, we are not going to cover all the CROs. We're only going to cover certain ones, but we're going to cover it more, in more depth, which I think at this level, advanced OOP, we should focus more on the OOP. Okay? We definitely are going to talk about API, how you can program re, uh, with respect to some API. Okay? Uh, tests will be very uh, important for this uh, course. I keep mentioning JUnit tests. Can I just, I'm just wonder, don't be shy. Any one of you here who has not used JUnit ever in your first year? Not. Everyone has, has used it? Well, that's good. Good, I'm happy. Good. But still, be patient, you know, just to go over my tutorial for the first two weeks, Lab Zero Part 1, Part 2. Make sure it's kind of aligned with your current knowledge. And document the implementation. We will do a little bit, if time permitted, to me. At this point, it's not that important. Okay. But of course, my other colleagues may not, may not be so happy if I say that, but at least from my judgment. And we talk, we talk about aggregation and composition. We'll do that. Inheritance. This is my most favorite topic of all time, inheritance. Most likely, we will start talking about inheritance after we have covered all the foundational and the other more advanced stuff, maybe after the reading week. About one or two weeks after the reading week, we'll spend about three weeks covering inheritance only. I'll tell you the story from the beginning until how you can go beyond inheritance. Inheritance is so important, especially if you want to learn about OOP. It's a very, for those of you who hasn't learned about inheritance, it's going to be challenging, hard, however, very rewarding if you master that. I'll give you a systematic introduction and I'll let you master that. And for those of you who actually learned about inheritance before, maybe in the high school, maybe in your own free time, I suspect maybe you can definitely learn some more insight into it. We'll see. Okay, we'll, we'll have some fun when we get to inheritance. Not yet, after the reading week. Okay, so those of you who really want to learn a lot about recursion, let me tell you this. I think at this level here, learning recursion, even though it could be useful, but I think uh, it might be a subject you will practice more, maybe in 2011, the sequel to this course, the data structure course. But I'm still going to cover maybe he uh, used about two weeks in the final stage of this course just to give you some knowledge. So it will be a very good transition to the next semester, uh, to 2011. Okay, so just, uh, just legend re recursion. And for these three CROs, temporarily, uh, well, tentatively, we are not going to cover them. But if you're really interested in these topics, I do have some very nice recordings. Let me know. I'll, I'll let you know in private. I don't want to scare your other classmate, right? I'll let you know. Yes. No, nope. if I, oh, oh, one thing I think uh, I, I should really let you know. 
st student, uh, my student in the past, even though they complained that my test might be a little bit too demanding, uh, that's true, you will experience that. On the other hand, I never test anything I didn't teach to my students. So everything I taught you, you can expect it to be somehow appear in the exam. For example, if I didn't cover anything about linked list, there's no way I'm going to put it in the, in the exam or the assessment. Okay, just to let you know. Okay, let me go back to the syllabus over here. Okay, good. Okay, grading scheme. That's also important. Absolutely. Okay, so the 12% over here, okay, let me just uh, emphasize again the 12%, basically, automatic rewarding of the 12% uh, as long as submitted in time. It's so important. If you didn't submit in time, too bad. So you, you wouldn't get it. So that's normal. Okay. okay. And for the uh, for the first two weeks, we're gonna do part one and part two for your lab number zero. The instruction is already up. So since I cannot really show to you uh, from the browser, so I'm gonna uh, send everybody some reminder after the class. Okay. And for lab number one to lab number five. Oh, I beg your pardon. I do have five labs. Maybe not. Uh, maybe not four. Okay. One lab number one to lab five, two percent each. And I think uh, except for lab number three, lab number three is uh, maybe more straightforward compared with others. For lab number one, two, four, and five, they are reasonably challenging, which is good. You definitely want some challenge, you know, so you can struggle and grow intellectually. So I would say, so that's why you can rest assured you will always get the 12% as long as, as, as long as you submit in time. However, be responsible for your learning. Get busy with the lab as early as you can. Otherwise, you will definitely suffer, uh, will perform poorly in the test. Okay, for the programming test. The first one, you, I'll, I'll show you the dates. Uh, there's a calendar as well. So the first one, since this is your first one, I'll make it a little bit lighter, 5%. So if you really are not really used to the format or my style, you can, you, can, you can afford to maybe perform not so well. That's okay, but just catch up you know, later. The second one will be a little bit higher, and the third one will be a little bit higher as well. Total, we got 25% for the programming test. Okay, it's gotta be done in, individually without any collaboration. There will be written tests, as I said before, mostly, oh, it's gonna be multiple choice. I wouldn't say mostly. It's gonna be, gonna be completely multiple choice. If I really want to change this, I'll let you know within two weeks. 6% each, 18%, and the exam is going to be cumulative 45%. So that's why I said it's not really your best interest to really miss an assessment and have the weights shifted to, it, to the exam. Of course, you sometimes really got some medical reason, that's totally understandable. I, I can still do the shift, but, Try not to. All right. Any questions so far before I talk about attendance? All right. And this is also something I'm doing that for the first time for my students. I hope that it can really give you some extra uh, motivation. Oh, just before that, I'll get to the attendance. The mapping from row marks into letter grade, it's a completely standard, and then we simply calculate the weighted sum of your row marks and then assign the letter grade. That's, that's completely standard. I'm not doing anything that's not normal. So this part here, I'll, I'll skip. You can read it later if you got any doubts. Uh, okay, just one more thing before I talk about attendance. Expect a weekly workload. According to Lasson, for every credit, you will spend about three to 4.5 hours of work. That means for us, we got three credits for this course between nine and 13.5 hours, okay? Of course, if you find that you can do very effectively by doing less, good for you. If you really find that you have to do much more than what's, uh, what's really expected, don't feel bad. It's a foundational course. It might take some time for you to click. That's okay, all right? Don't feel bad if you spend too much time on this course. Don't feel bad. Okay, so let me, I'll just give you some rough estimate. You'll spend about three hours every week to attend my lectures. Of course, you might decide to maybe drop by my office hour, maybe the schedule lab to ask questions, right? That might add on top of that. And outside of the lecture, you're gonna complete the lab assignments, right? And also you're gonna study for the lectures and tests. Try to study for the contest. I think that if you come to my class every time and try to get as much as you can, and then since I also try to record my lecture, so I would say, given that you, even if you only got about 60% of the comprehension in the class, you can still fill out the gap for the 40% in the recording. That's really my real intention for doing this. Try not to replace the in-person lecture by the recording. We all know pretty well, it's pretty boring to watch the 
how many hours did you guys watch during the pandemic? 12 hours for four courses, right? At, at least, right? So we are quite tired of that, right? So anyway, it's, uh, I'll leave that to you. Okay, though it's a foundational course, it's not unreasonable to spend more time. That's definitely okay, okay? Okay, what about attendance? Okay, so now, let me give you the first principle and I'll refer you to the formula which I'm gonna follow faithfully. Number one, if you miss the classes, you, still can, you can still access the lecture recording. You wouldn't be penalized for not attending the classes, number one. Number two, I really want to encourage you to come to my classes. As you can see, I try not to really follow through what's already on the document or the slides. I try to you know, just tell you in an intuitive way what, how things are working. So I really want to encourage you to come. So here's the, uh, the thing. There will be a formula which I will show to you, uh, you see part of it. You can get up to 5% bonus of your, uh, of your total grade. It's like a one letter grade. Right? Uh, you can think that's maybe not too much, but you know, maybe for some of you, you might you think uh, that can help you if you actually uh, happen to fail maybe some of the uh, written tests or programming tests. I think that can be, that can be helpful. Anyway, it's, uh, the choice will be up to you. And we're going to use a, a software called iClicker. Let me write it down over here. And on the syllabus, there is a site which I refer there. iClicker. Free. And you have to make sure you register an account for that under York University. Not New York University, York University. Don't get it wrong. Otherwise, you wouldn't uh, be able to participate in the class. Okay, okay so I think uh, next week, we, uh, over the weekend, before next Monday, please try to download the iClicker onto your computer, your mobile phone, your tablet, whatever, and bring to the class. So for next Monday and Wednesday, let's do some experiments, checks on the attendance. Make sure everything's okay. And then starting from next week, I, I can sporadically take attendance. I don't necessarily take attendance every week. It's up to me. If I want to take it, I'll take it. Okay, but here is the constraint on my side. Let me just go there. I will take between, uh, over here. I will take between 12, to 23 attendances uh, throughout the semester. Once I got that number there, right? And this will be the formula over here, but I'll let you study the math over there. By the way, do you know what the symbol is? Anybody? Floor, awesome, thank you. That's a floor. Anyway, I'm not gonna bother you with the mathematical detail. It's precise, it's there, but the idea will be the more classes you attend, the more you can get 5% bonus. Okay, one question here you might have. I attend almost every class, but I miss maybe one. Can I still get a 5%? The answer is yes. If you try to do the math over here, let's just give you one example. Okay, let's say this. Let's say in total I take, let's say 12 times for the attendance. And I say here, if you actually attend 10 or more, you get a 5%. So what about the minus two, right? That means you can miss two classes. What does that, those two classes mean? So if you miss the class because maybe there's a traffic jam, maybe TTC was not so efficient, or maybe because you were do, simply don't feel well, that's okay, it's accommodated. But if you really have to miss more than two classes, you think you have a valid reason to get 5%, you have to speak to me with a very complete documentation. But it's bonus, right? So that's, that means uh, I might be a little bit stricter on the policy, okay? Okay guys, I'm not gonna waste your time, but you can look at that, I think it's rather clear. If there's anything that may, may not be consistent in the policy, let me know. I'll be more than happy to listen. Okay, one more thing. For t before next Monday, I'll remind you as well, please go to this link on the syllabus. There is a starter guide over there that you want to follow to install the eye clicker. Okay, and I can give you a little bit of hints. When will Jackie take attendance? When the class is almost full like this, I wouldn't take it. When it seems to me, oh, quite many of you actually missed the class, I'll take it, right? So try not to miss too many classes. Of course, it's only bonus. I really hope everybody could get 5% more. I really hope. All right, please follow. And then it's going to use your location. I think uh, somehow, interestingly, iClicker has a feature to say, in order for you to check in, you have to, you have to be somehow 100 meters within the distance from my computer where I log into the instructor account. So if you think you can simply log in from your home, I'm afraid it's not possible. Okay, so please just come. 
don't think this is really trying to make your life harder. I'm really trying to encourage you to come. If you don't get a bonus, that's okay. You might still be okay by watching the lectures, recording, and do everything else by yourself. But I would encourage you to come. Let me learn together with you. Okay, let me just go. Okay, we got a few items there, and then I'll try to see if I can at least cover half an hour of the contents today. We'll try. Okay, which is more exciting. So this is the semester calendar here, and if you go to the study site, you will see a copy of that. Let me go, go to a slightly larger version there, over here. Right, you kind of lay out exactly uh, what's gonna happen in the semester. For example, your lab number zero, part one, has been released. So I will send a reminder email or announcement on eClass right after the class, I'll do that. So you can start working on that. And for your lab zero, part one, let me just give you a very quick tip. Uh, so I will also open up the PDF to go over with you maybe on Monday, but at least know what's going to happen. For lab zero part one. Part one, okay. Number one, you're going to install Eclipse. And for those, uh, I would suggest you also try to uh, access the remote labs facility of the, our department, remote labs. It's a backup option because sometimes maybe your Eclipse, the Eclipse on your machine fell, it still have a backup option for you, Eclipse. And number two, uh, I would suggest you try to install a GitHub account and make sure it has a private repository. Okay, it's not required, but it's recommended. I think it's very uh, well, uh, well known practice to read document your software and keep track of it using GitHub, right? I got tutorial videos for all of that. Right? Just make sure you spend enough time to uh, go over that. Okay, and after that, the next important part will be there, there are some documents you will have to read. Specifically two. Number one, how to infer Java uh, code from JUnit's uh, assertions. Or let me say tests, that might be more accurate. So this is a very simple document to actually give you the principle. That's something you will need for every programming test. That's something I will also follow consistently for your labs as well. So please make sure you go over that. And number two, I'm pretty sure in the first year you learned about arrays, right? Primitive array, square bracket notation. However, Maybe a good number of you haven't learned about how to combine primitive array together with classes, how to manipulate things accordingly. If that's the case, then you're gonna learn about it, okay? It's something that's already covered, okay, let me say two things. Number one, there is a document about uh, programming, there's a programming pattern. Using array notation, you will see the more detail when you see the document. Okay, the document, uh, in addition to it, we also got tutorial videos. We got part one and part two. So for this, uh, for this week, you're gonna look at part one. Okay, you got exactly the links uh, in, the, in the lab zero part one instruction. And this one over here, it really try to walk you through from zero until 50. And next time we'll do 51 to 100, right? To really review about all the core concepts about OOP, right? So please, Please take this opportunity to catch up if you find any shaky foundation from the first year. Okay, tutorial videos. And that one there is also going to reinforce what you read from programming pattern over here. So I would say, you know, if you can do both, why not, right? Just to reinforce the idea. That's something we'll see very often, not just for this course, later as well. And at the end, you're going to submit whatever code that's actually from your, uh, whatever code you actually type from the YouTube video, and then you're going to submit it for grading. That's for lab zero part one. Okay, and also submit the exported project. I'll also show you how you can do ex uh, export in the Eclipse as well. Exported uh, projects, yeah. And there is something called web submit. Again, I will show you on Monday, since I don't have internet access today. All right, that's the overall picture. Of course, there's some detail I'm not really mentioning, but that's the overall idea. So I would suggest today, go to that, that lab zero power instruction and then start watching the YouTube videos. 
okay already Alrighty, let's now go back to the calendar. Okay, so the idea would be uh, you will be starting your lab zero part one today and then you will be due for submission next Friday. You got about one week, maybe slightly more than one week. And then we're gonna release your lab zero part two, similar format, you're just gonna type out the code in the YouTube and learn the idea. Feel free to come to my office hour or lab and say, okay, Jackie, this part of the uh, code you pipe in the video in the tutorial, I'm not sure what you're doing. That's okay. Come to me. All right. Just come early rather than late. Lab zero part one, lab zero part two, and then we got lab one, which will be based on these two. Okay. And we got lab number two, we got lab number three, lab number four, lab number five. The reason that lab number three is only one way because that one is a reasonably okay, not not so challenging one. But given that you already struggle a bit in the previous part. That one will be rather easy, so don't worry. I think one week is definitely reasonable, don't worry. What about assessment? I also try to give you uh, about a lecture number. Today's lecture number one, and then two, three, four, you know, and, and, until we got 24, right? Your first assessment will be during the lab session, written test number one. It will be about 20 days later, okay? It's very easy for you to see the cover. Everything will make sense. Written test number one, of course, I'm not going to cover this lecture here. It's not fair. I will cover up to here. Five, four, three, two, and whatever I might cover today. Right? Okay, and similarly, let me just make, give you one more example. What about written test number two? It's going to cover, not this one here, 12, 13, 10, 11, 8, 9, 6, and 7. That's also laid out in the syllabus as well. Okay? If there's any exception to it, I will also let you know. And for the programming test, your first one is going to happen in October 4th, right before the reading week. So I would say, let me say less today. I will try to give you some, number one, some example test. If possible, I'll try to schedule maybe some mock-up test in the actual Williams Small Center for you to try out. I think that might be the best for you, right? I, do, I really want you to succeed, so I'll try to do everything possible, okay? Okay, you also got written test uh, two, programming test two, and etc. right? That's the schedule. And for the exam, it's going to be somewhere between 8th and 23rd. Of course, sh you shouldn't really uh, arrange for any travel plan in that period. You shouldn't. All right. Any question about interpreting the calendar? Any questions? Everybody is okay? All right. Let me just go back to syllabus. I think we're almost there. Okay, that's about the coverage I just mentioned. And for the weekly schedule, which will be here, that's clearer. All right, Monday, Wednesday. Okay, Monday, Wednesday over here, lecture, and also we got office hour. For today, you can see you got, we got some Zoom office hour in the afternoon. And we got in-person office hour tomorrow, if you want to see me in the office. My office is just upstairs, 2043. And also the lab session over here. And we're lucky, all the three lab sections are in the same uh, room, also they happen simultaneously. Just make everything easier for everybody. Okay, let me see if there's anything else I want to cover in the, uh, okay. And this part over here is just about the topics that we're gonna cover according to my experience from last year. Okay, but that's uh, not to, uh, I might switch order sometimes, maybe sometimes I'll cover, maybe spend a little bit more time or less time on certain topics, but let's be a little bit dynamic, flexible. Just follow my lecture, just enjoy. That's about the, oh, excuse me. That's about the end of the syllabus. Any questions? about how the course is going to be run. All right, ho hopefully everybody is okay, right? Not panicking too much. Well, if you want, if you're thinking about switching the section, do it early, right? But, you know, I hope everybody will stay. You know, I, I really enjoy, actually, I, I'm pretty sure I have lots of enjoyment this semester. Normally, when I teach 2030, I teach a bigger section, like with the 144 student, or even two sections, but this time, I got 66 of you guys. I can give you more of my personal attention. You like it or not, I'll give you some attention, all right? Anyway, we'll, we'll learn. Okay, let me just f finish uh, some more slides and then we definitely have to do a little bit of review of the OOP, okay? I'll do some very light amount today and then I'll definitely do more intensive review uh, next Monday and Wednesday, but we still gotta do something. 
Okay, so uh, give you a little bit of background about adapting to the second year. Okay, I don't need to do a survey, but I think uh, some of most of you, since it's an engineering section, most of you should be coming from 1021. Some of you might be coming from 1022 if you're in the CS major, the mobile computing. By the way, mobile computing course has been renamed. It's not introduction to OOP. Students are no longer required to learn about Android. Anyway, just for your information. And or it might be coming from 1720 for the digital media, but that's okay. Doesn't matter where you're coming from. The first two weeks are really to make sure everybody will be on the equal standing point, starting from week number three. That's really my intention. Right? Okay, so for your first year, you definitely try to having some fun by visualizing the programming effects on some physical devices. For example, in 1022, you try to visualize the effects of your Android program on the tablet or some emulator. If you're in 1021, maybe you try to maybe light up some uh, LED lights. Uh, you, we used to use a fidget board, but I believe maybe James has changed that maybe to Adreno, whatever. Okay, but the same idea. However, it's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, before the however part, you may have done a little bit of testing by using the console application by system that are the print line to see exactly what the values are, or you try to use some G-unit test cases. Since you guys said you have seen some G-unit test cases before, but I presume it may not be so, uh, so intensive or extensive about the G-unit test. It may just little. However, we need to realize for the real software developer, you don't really have the chance usually to really look at exactly how things will run on the physical devices. It usually only happen in the so-called deployment development uh, stage, or maybe integrate, uh, or integrated, or integration testing stage. But it's not what we're gonna talk about in this course. We're mainly talking about implementation. If you are the implementer of some software, you want to be responsible for the correctness of your code. And later in 2011, you should also be responsible for the efficiency of your code. Anyway, let's focus on correctness for this course. Well, this is something I hope you will be able to grasp from day one. But of course, you need some time to really struggle and really pick it up. Programming problems are explained by expected methods API. So when you go over that JUnit uh, documents, uh, let's say given some JUnit test cases, how you can derive the Java methods or classes from there, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not really trying to show you, okay, this is how I want the app to run on the, app, uh, the tablets and program, me, program to me accordingly. No, you want to think a little bit higher level. And all the tests must be able to be run automatically, not manually. Think about tablet, for example. Let's say I look at, I look at my tablets uh, to be uh, running my program. If I want to change something, I change something on my computer, reload my program on the tablets, I need to refresh the functionality on the tablet and do it manually for the testing. That's way too inefficient. You cannot afford to actually do this when you are doing some serious programming. Okay, what you want to do would be something like JUnit test. And JUnit testing is only uh, like a specific platform just for Java. If you go to any other programming language, like a C Sharp, C++, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe whatever language you go to, normally they would have some unit testing framework. They would. So whatever you pick up from JUnit in this course, it's going to be useful for, uh, beyond as well. And you want to be able to think abstractly without seeing the changes on the physical device, right? And why would that be important? Hey, just uh, those, many of you eventually will go to some job interview. You can take a look at this link. That's how people do interviews at Google. What you are given will not be a computer, well, you'll be given some blackboard, some whiteboard. They'll give you some program to write. Write it on the board. How well can you really write a, board, uh, write a code? Number one, you will compile. Number two, you will be able to justify. You will actually pass a reasonable number of test cases. Be being reasonably correct, right? That's something uh, you can uh, take a look. All right, what is this course about? I'll just summarize in two points for you. Uh, number one, we want to solve problems, of course, just to be more precise. We want to do procedural programming without the OO, step by step. You want to write code line by line. Object orientation, that's something I would love to review as well, maybe uh, partly today. You want to design a software artifacts where the architecture corresponds to the real world. For example, 
if I want to write a Java project to maybe simulate the classroom, I need to have multiple classes to, uh, to really correspond to different kinds of entity. For example, maybe professor, students, desk, podium, light, right? So every different kinds of entities, they should be a corresponding Java class. That's some principle, which I also document in the slides. You can also take a look. And we want to express your solutions in Java. Of course, whatever ideas you learn, especially inheritance, if you move on later to other old uh, object-oriented language, you definitely can still uh, apply the concept. It's not just specific to Java. Okay, study tips. I'll give you some very quick tips. And I try to record every lecture, but please try not to replace it for coming to the class. Because you, what I really recommend, since it's going to be recorded, just try to focus on maximum comprehension in the lecture. And then whatever that's left, whatever gap you might have, you can refer to the recording later. It's going to be much, much more efficient. And take notes if you want to. Actually, uh, if you want to take notes on your iPad, or you want to take notes on the paper, I think it's a very good way uh, for you to kind of remember and recall the information. OK. And final tips. Uh, I think uh, inspiration is more important than perspiration, meaning that working hard is important. But working hard doesn't necessarily imply you will get good grades, I'm afraid. That's just a reality, right? But what can you do? Well, while you're working hard, I want you to always think on top of what we're doing. Think about why are things done in this way? Why are they not done in another way? Be curious and try to see if you can reason about what's happening in this course yourself. If you got any trouble understanding how things are connected, always speak to me. I think that's really a good way for you to uh, think on top of what's happening. Okay, and then uh, over here, I got two links for you, coding bad and lead code, especially for coding bad. Once we get to the recursion week, uh, which will be the final two weeks, I'm going to give you lots of examples to really try to study. And I think coding bad is also a very good site with a lot of a nice example. I will also try to go over some of them with you, the challenging ones. But it's a nice site for you to try out some extra examples. OK, and be curious about yeah, exactly what I just meant. OK, uh, final points. If you need any accommodation, if you've got an accommodation letter, please let me know uh, as soon as you can. So I will make sure I set up the accommodation for you accordingly. OK? Guys, that's about syllabus and how the course is going to be run. Any comments? Any doubts? Anyone? Everybody is OK? Awesome. OK, good. Thank you. Well, I hope I will still see at least those, uh, all of you on uh, next Monday, I really hope. All right? We'll see. Again, 8.30 is a very weird time to really uh, start a day, I know. But what can we do? I wanted to change this time for us. They said, Jackie, just wake up early. All right, let's now try to cover some contents. And it's mainly going to be some reference pointing. And then I want to talk about conceptually what object orientation really is. And then I might start developing some Eclipse code, which is a slightly different example from what you will see in the Lab Zero Part 1, the tutorial. So you can see both. All right. And this slide here is already on the uh, uh, study site. Okay? And my goal is to cover as many concepts as possible for review. Okay? I don't necessarily read off the slides for every one of them, but we'll try to see as, uh, do as much as we can. My goal is to finish uh, the review uh, on next Wednesday. So that means the week after, we will be able to, able to cover something new. That's the goal. Okay? So really take advantage of the, the coming one or two weeks to review the OP uh, by using the study material I gave to you. Okay, so this, uh, this tutorial series over here, refer, uh, Refurbished Store, I believe that one is your lab zero, part one, and part two, right? It's a tutorial series. Go there, and it's very explicit, it has part one and part two. You only do part one for this week. Of course, feel free to actually go uh, ahead of time if you want to, right? That's the first link. And then, for those of you who actually want to do a little bit more about the foundation, you can also refer to this. It's also some tutorial. Especially, I want to drag your attention to 
the following concept, which is very, very important. Let me go back here. When you are doing, Eclipse, uh, doing the uh, programming on e uh, an IDE, like an Eclipse, it's standing for Integrated Developments Environments. Okay. IDE exists for different languages for, uh, for Java. We got Eclipse, we got IntelliJ. Maybe that's what you guys used maybe in the first year. But for this course, we have to stick with uh, Eclipse. For the submission of the lab, for taking your programming test, we all use Eclipse. So please, make sure you download it and get used to it. Okay. And for this course, we're going to use uh, Eclipse. And there are two parts over here. One part, of course, you got to use the editor to write your Java classes. That one is actually obvious. But let me, uh, if you don't mind, let me do one more survey. How many of you have used the so-called debugger? If have you ever used a debugger, maybe in IntelliJ or Eclipse, could you please raise your hand? Debugger, if you have. OK, not many, but that's OK. Again, in the tutorial, I also taught you from scratch. So please learn it. Debugger is so important because debugger, oh, excuse me. Debugger is your only friend when you are working independently. Maybe in the lab sometimes, or maybe in the programming test, if you really think your program is not really returning the correct output, how can you find out where it goes wrong? Debugger. Later on, if you become a software engineer, if you really run into issues with your program, uh, with your implementation, you cannot just come to your supervisor asking, asking, uh, asking what's wrong, right? You gotta use debugger. So that's something I want you to pick up. And when would be the best time to really uh, ask questions about debugger? Either my office hour or the schedule lab. I'll be more than happy to walk you through how to use debugger, but you gotta start, okay? So I want you to pay extra attention about how to use a debugger in Eclipse. It is so fundamental. So, all right. All right, let me go back here. Okay. You know what? It, since it's our first class, I'll try to finish just five minutes earlier. How about we go until about 9.45 just for today? I don't want to go too much, okay? But later on, we got to go until 9.50, okay? I mean, for the, yeah, for, for the each class. Okay, so this is uh, something uh, more foundational if you want to actually look at, uh, you want to look at the Eclipse, you know, et cetera, right? Just some very nice cross-referencing for you. And also some notes as well. This is optional only if you find that you need to maybe uh, strengthen your foundation for this course. Okay, so these are the two written notes I mentioned before. One of them is about inferring Java classes from JUnit tests. And the other one is about how to use array-typed attributes. Right, so these are the two documents. I would say, I'm not saying you have to finish reading them by next Monday, no. Try to finish them by the end of the second week because you, you need time to read them, you need time to digest, you need time to really ask me questions and maybe think more. It's really important, okay? I cannot emphasize more. Okay, uh, for this review lecture, we're gonna I'll talk about object orientation, which I'll speak about right away. And also, we want to distinguish between Ah, how about this? I already gave you a little bit of hints. Can anybody, well, this may be testing what you learned, for a very fundamental question from the first year. Can anybody tell me, if, uh, let's say there's an interview question, what is the difference between a class and an object? Think about it. I would, let, I would love to hear some answer. Don't be shy. It's a very typical question, not just in the interview. Usually when you tell people that you know about OOP, people will ask you, what's the difference between class and object? Please. Um, so what's the difference between class and object? The question is the class. Yes, I agree. Yes, true. Yes, objects are simply instantiations or instances of a class. Think about a class defines the characteristic of so many instances or objects you might instantiate from that particular class. That's the definition. Very good, thank you. All right, having that basic understanding, let's see. And we're gonna, again, I'm gonna review how to use this keyword. Very important, right? Maybe uh, I wouldn't 
get to here maybe today, maybe the next week. And then after the instances, and we're going to use a new keyword and also the dot notation, right? One thing just to give you a little bit of look ahead, maybe in the tutorial video as well, but in the programming test and also in the exam or in the assessment, ultimately you should be able to, let's say you have a class over here, let's say. I'll just uh, sketch the idea, let's say class A, and then let's say you're now within a particular method over here. Okay, let's not worry about the public just yet. Let's say here you're supposed to write a line over here, right? And for this line over here, you may start with, for example, this dot. Maybe what you did in the first year was only about maybe this dot A, where A is simply just an attribute of class A. That might be what you did. But in this course, you deserve something more challenging. Later on, we're going to give you some principle about, let's say I say dot A, and then dot C, dot D, dot E, and this list can go on, as long as you're in the right context. It is something called association, or navigation between the classes. That's something we will cover. And if you cannot really master the dot notation over here, you're not really uh, grasping the essence of OOP. Not really. Okay, but we'll get there. I just want to give you some uh, look ahead. Okay, and okay. Can anybody tell me, but I'm going to review this as well. Can anybody tell me what does it really mean to have reference aliasing in Java? Aliasing. Yeah, let me just see if any of your classmates, yeah. Anybody? Don't be shy if you're just trying to... Let me give you one hint. Aliasing is a concept that we borrow from real world. What does it really mean to have an alias? It's usually for criminal. Maybe they're working, uh, maybe when their real identity is Jackie, but somehow when they actually commit some crime, they will use another name, maybe Peter. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not offending anyone here. Okay, I'm just making some example. That's a, what alias really mean. But what does really aliasing really mean in OOP? Sorry, say it again. I don't quite catch you. Uh, it's not really about efficiency, actually. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not really about efficiency. It's something to do with uh, some very special phenomenon that can happen so easily in OOP. Not really for efficiency. It is true, well, yeah, let me just, uh, okay, maybe you're partly right. I'll explain that. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. I think that you're also correct as well about efficiency. Maybe space efficiency, to be more precise. Not really time efficiency. Okay, let me uh, drag, uh, sketch the idea very quickly, but we'll do some challenging exercise next time. Okay? Aliasing, conceptually. Let's say this is some objects in the memory, some objects conceptually. I'm going to show you more details about how to visualize objects. And let's say currently we have, let's say, variable one, which stores the address of this particular object. Diagrammatically, that's how we're going to draw it. Now, why would this be a space efficiency mechanism? Let's say I somehow I, I would like to copy the contents of these objects into another object. One thing which is called a reference copy would be I simply got another variable v2, but rather than simply copy everything over here and let it point to there, it could be space wasting. So what I can do instead is do this. Let it store the same address as here. Conceptually, diagrammatically, they are pointing to the same objects. That's called aliasing. The same objects has two identities, or multiple identities, v1 and v2. And what you just said is also very valuable. Be careful about aliasing, because let's say, for example, if I got some value i over here, which is 23, let's say. If I say v1 over here dot i is assigned to, let's say, 14. It's not exactly valid Java code, but let's just uh, deal with it conceptually. In this case, if I try to say v1.i, v1.i, referring to this, change that to 14. What's going to happen to v2.i? Should be 
14. Agree? If you look at the diagram, it's very easy to see. However, if you only look at the code over here, it wouldn't make sense. When I change the i, I change the i of v1. Why would the i of v2 also change at the same time? Shouldn't that still be 23? So that's really the idea about aliasing. And what I like to do in the written test is to give you some program that got some sophisticated aliasing manipulation and let you try out. And in order to answer a question like this, you have to know how to draw, which I do always in the lecture. So try to learn how I draw the objects. Yes. Sorry? Uh, okay. Um, I would say don't think of them as a pointers because uh, you guys might be taking 2031 in the same semester, right? EECS. 2031. Okay. Let me say this. Good, good points. Okay, think about Java reference variables. Think, think, think about them as R pseudo pointers, which means they are kind of like a pointer because they store addresses. However, they are not exactly pointer. Why? Let's say in C, if, you, if I have a pointer like I, I would be able to say maybe I++. plus plus. In that way, I can kind of move around the memory by, by, by the by units of the storage, right? For those of you who actually know what a pointer is. It's something called pointer arithmetic. However, you cannot do pointer arithmetic in Java reference variable. For example, here, if I say v1++, plus plus, it would be invalid. You cannot really do pointer arithmetic. However, the only thing you can do is to reassign the address to something else. That's all you can do. Okay, does that kind of uh, clarify? Yeah. I think that might be also a very common interview question. So people might ask you, what's the difference between Java reference variable and C pointer? They are similar in the sense that they both of them store addresses. They are different in the sense that in C, you can do pointer arithmetic. But in Java, no you can only replace the value of the address that's stored in the reference variable by something else. That's all you can do. All right. All right, any uh, follow-up to this? Okay. As I promised, I'll just cover only until 45. Okay. Yeah, more questions. Go ahead. Sorry, say it again. You want to change the program to what? Mm -hmm. For V1, right? And then yeah, so you can think of, okay, so the, it's, read this example like this. Initially, okay, how about this? Let me be clear. V1, V2, let's say somehow they point to the same objects, let's say, okay? At this point, if I say V1, oh, let's say I, somehow we set it to be 23. V1.I, v2 dot i, both of them will be 23. Okay? Let's say I try to do another one. Let's say here, I try to say uh, v1 is assigned, uh, v1 dot i is assigned to maybe 14. I'll change this to be 14. So after this, if I try to check the two values again, I'm going to get v1 dot i, v2 dot i is going to be 14. Okay? Make it more fun. Let's say, for example, there is another object over here. That's called a V3. Oh, sorry. That one there, let's say I, has somehow been set to 46. Okay? And I want you to focus on this initial block, this uh, second block. Okay? I want to do another thing. Number one, I want to do, let's say V2 is assigned to V3, okay? And then I want to say something similar to this. V1 dot I uh, 67. Okay, so these are the two main updates I try to do. And then I'm gonna check V1 dot I 
V to the I. Guys, I'll give you one minute to think about number one, how you might modify the diagram. Number two, what should the values be for V1 to I and V2 to I in purple? Think about it, I'll give you one minute. Okay. Let me try to give you some hints, which may be good or may be bad. According to what we did earlier, after V1 to I is assigned to some value, it will change both V1 and V2, right? That's why it will be 14 for both. That means if we try to be consistent, if I change V1 to I to be 67, now V1 to I, V2 to I, V2 to I should be 67 for both. That seems to be a reasonable thinking, right? Is that the case? My hands sometimes can be good, sometimes can be misleading intentionally. So you want to judge. Think a little bit more. And after this, I think I will just do a two or three uh, more minutes and then I'll stop, right? I think this is really important. If you really are struggling with this, think about it by watching the recording again, but come to me if you really still struggle. I'll try to explain maybe slightly, uh, maybe more slowly, maybe by adding more details. But for now, I want you to think about it. Okay, now here's a question. Let's go separately. What should be V1 to I? 60, uh, 67? Good? That makes sense. This one is obvious. Now I think the, R, the debatable point will be what's V2 to I? 67, 46, or 14? Forty-six, okay. Correct answer should be forty-six, not sixty-seven. If you thought it should be sixty-seven because you thought it's the like the hints I gave to you to mislead you, that's not a way. Okay, let's now solve it. Well, it's it's fun about drawing diagrams to trace the old people. It's so much fun, especially adding arrays, which I will do maybe next Wednesday. Okay, let's do this. Let's say V two is assigned to V three. What does that mean? It's a very important uh, uh, line to, uh, to know. And I also explained that very clearly in the uh, tutorial video as well. This one means, well, think about this. If I say integer i is equal to 23, integer j is assigned to 46. If I say i is assigned to j, that means I want to copy the value of j into i. Right? It's uh, what you learn from integer assignments. Right? Now, I'm doing something very similar over here. I'm basically copying whatever address that is stored in V3. Replace it for what is stored in V2. Diagrammatically, I'm saying this. For V2, that is going to be changed. Rather than pointing to over here, it's going to point to wherever V3 is pointing to. Think about this before next Monday. Okay, let me just say a little bit more. And so after this, when you say V1 is going to be assigned to 67, change this to 67, and it's not going to impact V2 because it's now pointing to this object over here. It's a very typical manipulation for OOP. All right. Any uh, doubts, I can clarify now. What well, you want to think about it. You want to think about it, right? Guys, think about it. Uh, if you still have some confusion about this, raise your hand next time on Monday. I might just go over some more example with you. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. No, it's not confusing. Actually, you know what? in some way, that's completely okay. Think it this way. I'll, I'll try to make the uh, example maybe more, adding more context. Thinking this way. V1, V2, V3, they are declared to be the same type. Maybe we say A and then V1, A, V2, A, also V3. So they are declared to be the same class because they are the, using the same template. So that means the same template that they have the same attributes, but different objects may have different values for the same attribute, right? So that's a very common phenomenon. Yeah. Good question, I like it. Guys? 
give me just one minute. I will tell you what you may want to read over uh, before next Monday, and then I'm, we're done. Since I promised you, I'm going to finish earlier. Okay, so this slide, uh, this slide, I'm going to go over with you on Monday. I'll start with this. However, I want you to actually start by looking from start by this slide diagram here, and then about observe model execute. I'm going to explain this diagram as well on Monday, but I'll, I'm hoping that you can maybe take a look. And then especially, I want you to start reading the slides from here about object orientation from here. That just gives you some example about how you can model. This part, I'm not going to read off the slide in the class, so you can go over that. From here until, I'll give you the slide number. Just give me one more. Until slide 13, OK? That's what I need you to do. And then on um, uh, next week, Monday, Wednesday, I will definitely have some small project on the Eclipse open uh, developed together with you from scratch. So for those of you who may, who may want to type together with me, feel free to bring your laptop. All right, guys, nice, have, nice to have you. And hopefully I'll see as many of you next Monday. You guys take care. <laughs>